Broadcasting from the campus of Salisbury University, this is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7, putting Delmarva first. It's time for Delmarva Today with your host, Don Rush. There's a new paper in town. It's called the Salisbury Independent. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Salisbury Independent began publication in May and is a weekly. And on May 29th, the paper featured an interview with Mayor Jim Ireton. The same edition, the public forum section, the editor and general manager, Greg Bassett, wrote that the paper wanted to, quote, truly be the community's newspaper to unite community causes and put the public in the know when it comes to what truly matters. And we have Greg Bassett in our studios. And I see, by the way, you just couldn't stay away from the newspaper business. Is that right? I tried so hard, Don. I tried, <laughs> I tried so hard to get out of it. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the business suits my personality. I, I'm nosy. Um, love to gossip a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I people tell me I can write, and you got those three talents. You're stuck. I say that's the only thing you can do. <laughs> right, right. right, you've got to take information from people and run and tell. That's right. Well, uh, tell me a little bit about how did the concept of the uh, of the Salisbury Independent come about? Well, as may, many people might know, I was the longtime editor of the Daily Times, the daily newspaper here, the Gannett product in Salisbury, and with the footprint, the regional footprint uh, of a regional daily newspaper. Uh, and as things changed in the newspaper business, suddenly I found, found myself without a position anywhere. Um, and people, I looked for things other than journalism jobs, as you know, as, as you have seen and everyone has seen how the industry has contracted and changed so much just in the last 10 years. The disruptive innovation of the uh, internet and what that's done to, the, to content and how news is dispersed. Um, really seemed like there's not a big future in newspapers. Um, but people would come to me and they would say, we miss the old kind of community newspaper. We miss the paper that celebrates our successes. It doesn't just tell us what's wrong with our community, which celebrates and and, and sort of cherishes what makes our community special. Um, so the idea came up to do a weekly. I did a business plan. I was able to mm-hmm. get in with uh, independent newspapers, uh, a great national chain that specializes in community weekly newspapers with the idea their, their theory is sort of uh they call it refrigerator news the kind of news that you want to clip out and mm-hmm. put on your refrigerator so as an example um in this week's paper we have um eight pages of graduation photos from the four county that. high schools and it seems kind of hokey you know and it's not big breaking pulitzer prize winning news but it's the kind of news that people love and they appreciate and it reflects the positive stuff in our community so did you what would do what did you miss when you weren't in journalism um i missed i I missed the idea of putting a product out every day and getting feedback um i missed the the idea of writing a column and having people call and say no you got that all wrong or oh i remember that too Uh, i missed that back and forth with people uh, because people are really what it's all about that's right issues are important but the people are way beyond the issues uh if you look at salisbury in the last 20 years the problems in Salisbury haven't been issues problems so much. It's been people problems. It's been people not working together, not communicating, maybe being selfish, you know, <laughs> uh, in the government, in the business, people not finding a way to get along. Um, and I missed having some sort of a, not a role, but just sort of access to that kind of stuff. Um, so when we we started the independent, uh, the first person that I interviewed, I started a feature called the Q and A, right? Uh, where we try to interview a prominent newsmaker or um, public official or someone who just makes a difference in the community, and it's been amazing because they've allowed me to ask them really hard questions and they answer them. Um, so I think we've built a, you know maybe a reservoir of goodwill that we can tap on with these people. Uh, our first subject was Jim Perdue. Uh, he told me things about his dad and the business, which I never had the courage to ask him in that daily format. But in the weekly format, I felt comfortable enough to engage him on some of these issues. And he gave some really interesting answers. It's been really a fascinating thing. Um, And this week, I'm excited. I just did an interview yesterday with Palmer Gillis, who is a big local developer, um, to talk about his vision for downtown. He's got two big projects downtown right now, and we talked about that. And I just walked away just, just amazed to have access to ask this guy these questions. So my personality is that, and I think readers want to know this stuff. I think they want to hear what's positive in the community uh, what the challenges are certainly um but still what is good and what they can do to get involved uh, staying with just the the interview format for just a moment um 
because we do this all the time, right? And one of the things I always found was that I would read something in the newspaper, and you could see the reporters rushing around, or even if it was some extended interview. Uh, but yet, when you got them in the studio, you seem to get a lot more. Do you, do you, do you find that to be the case? That there, some, as opposed to that very tight structure that we that we tend to have when we run out and cover the story and then run back? Very much. Um, this week, we profiled Phil Tillman, right. who was the longtime county council president. Um, and Phil, in the context of 15 years ago when they, they implemented I Like to Tease Him, uh, it's not a teasing matter, but I like to tease him, you know, the, the largest tax, property tax increase in the history of Wicomico County. Um, when all that happened, I couldn't talk to Phil about those things. There, there was no way because I was writing editorials every day criticizing the tax increase. <laughs> and here we had a, a voter referendum situation where people were angry and they, they, they imposed the revenue cap because the county council had overreacted. And it took. 14, 12, 14 years before I was really able to ask Phil, what happened then? What were you guys thinking? Was it a mistake? You know, was it, did you do the right thing? So to have him as a questioner, he's got his own television show on Pack 14, but to, to put him on the spot like that and have him reflect on that all those years later, it was really an interesting discussion. But back then, I never could have asked him that because it was just so volatile at the time that he wouldn't have, he would have shut down. Um, so I'm, I think you almost need the, the specter of time to do that. And I think that's where I have an advantage because I know the community. I'm able to bring up stuff like that and ask those kind of questions. And people want to answer them. They want to talk about their failures or their challenges just as much as their successes. Now, you featured, I mentioned a moment ago, you, you featured Jim Ireton, um, yeah. and, uh, who's, who's had a very interesting history with the city, to say <laughs> yes, the least. I'm yes. sorry that he would agree, I think, by Yes, the way. he would. Uh, you, you write of Ireton, you said, Ireton has a passion about Salisbury that is apparent at all times. Even his critics will say that though they oppose his methods, they admire his love for the city and his willingness to embrace its residents. What do you make of Jim Ireton? And you've actually seen him over a longer period of time, I think, than, than I have. Um, when he first ran, great deal of controversy. I think it was I think the, the Daily Times actually endorsed him at, at one point. We did. And uh, what, what do you make of his tenure? And, and it seems to me that in many ways, certain changes have taken place. I mean, am I wrong about that, as particularly as you interviewed him and you, get, you assess where, where, where he is? Something's happened, and I'm not sure what it is. And, and the question I asked, um, and he, he really, he laughed hard at this question. Um, I asked him about the drama. You know, you certainly, I said, you've certainly had your share of drama uh, during your tenure. And, you know, it's the kind of thing it could go either way. When you ask That's a question right. like that, you never know. You know, you know, if I brought it up too soon, if I asked it out of context. Um, and he, he and he did the sarcastic thing. He's like, "Drama? What drama? What are you talking about?" You know, <laughs> and you can hear him saying it. Um, but certainly, he has had his his drama. But I, I get a sense now that he's working with people who at least are cooperative. Uh, that Jake Day's made a big difference on that council. That they're able to converse. Um, that they're maybe they're they're seeing things in a big picture instead of uh, micromanaging what goes on in the mayor's office. Um, so I, I see him more free to be himself and be the leader that he has the potential to be. Um, I've known Jim Ireton since he was a teenager. When I worked at the Daily Times as a copy editor on the desk, he used to come into the paper at night and watch us put out the paper. Um, he was that interested in what went on in the community. Um, and I never imagined he'd ever be mayor. But, right. But And I, I don't always, maybe even rarely agree with him on anything. But at the same time, you have to admire his passion. You know, he's still the mayor. You have to show him the respect because he's the mayor. Um, I used to get so mad, uh, you talk about Palmer Gillis in this mm -hmm. interview I just did, uh, I used to go to council meetings and he would yell at Barry Tillman. And I would say, Palmer, you can't yell at the mayor. Well, Greg, she's wrong. It doesn't matter. You just can't yell at the mayor. Rule one of life is don't yell at the mayor. You know, I, I would never yell at the mayor. Um, so you get an environment like that. It's impossible, I think, or very difficult to be political. Um, these guys aren't on Capitol Hill. They're friends and neighbors. They've got small businesses. It's just Salisbury. You know, it's not all about winning. I think it's about making the community better. So I think Jim gets that, and I hope he still gets that, and I hope the people who are on the council and surround him also get that. I mean, because one of the things as I looked at, you know, just in the 10 years that I've been here, is that there has been this contentiousness that uh, on a constant basis, and, yep. and, the, and the, the characters of the individuals seem to, to shift, but then it begins to break down. What is there something, as somebody said, is, asked me something the other day, is, is there something in the water? What is 
I mean, what is going particularly? You'll have people who are allies. I mean, Rachel Polk comes to my mind, <laughs> right. and and then suddenly she's at odds with with Barry Tillman. I mean, and this constant conflict. What what is it? I, I think, think what's the dynamic? I, I think just egos get involved, and anybody who's in a leadership position usually has an ego. It takes an ego to navigate those sure. waters. Rachel Polk and Barry Tillman always fascinated me because Barry Tillman would not have been reelected the mayor the first time if it wasn't for Rachel Polk's good work in District One and Von Siggers that carried her to re-election. She actually lost the rest of the city, but she she won the minority district in District 1 through the work of those people. But then it seemed like the mayor didn't understand that she owed anybody anything. Mm -hmm. They felt like they were owed something. Um, she was a leader. She was definitely a leader. And it just brought all this derision. Plus, there were back then there were problems with the police department and leadership in the police department, a lot of questions. Council wanted to run the police department. The mayor wanted to run the police department. So it's a classic scenario. But it just ended up with a lot of derision that wasn't necessary. People tell me all the time that down in Ocean City, that council used to really butt heads. Uh, so the newspaper was full of stories about people in Ocean City fighting. And, and in Ocean City, it, it changed because they did away with the uh, the non-residential voting. Right. Um, and also, the kind of people that became council members it used to be, the joke was, you had to own a boardwalk hotel to be on the city council in Ocean City. Well, people who had moved into town suddenly were on the council, and their, their mission and their ideas were a lot different. Um, so there was a lot of good, interesting... Um, <laughs> elbows under the basket so to speak um right. down in ocean city salisbury was quiet nothing ever happened but somewhere there around 2002 2000 2002 when mayor martin retired barry tillman came in as uh, a neighborhood advocate uh, first woman who was mayor uh, a lot to prove representing a whole different constituency there became tension um she got a whole new council after her first term or in the middle of her first right. term, or uh, at the yeah their first term um and it wasn't any different. <laughs> and then another whole council, and it wasn't any different. And even with Jim Ireton, a whole other council, it wasn't different. Um, and the people, like with, with Von Siggers and, and Rachel Polk and, and Barry Tillman, that tension, uh, allies who were enemies, not enemies, but certainly foes. Right. Um, the same thing happened with Jim Ireton and the Terry Cohens and the Debbie Campbells. They became foes. It, it's just fascinating to watch these human beings interact. But like I said... They're human beings. Oh, that's true. <laughs> and, and if one interviews them long enough, you, you begin to uh, understand that. Yeah. I think. I think. So, 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 how when you through this paper, how are you, how are you envisioning bringing this kind of thing into people's living rooms? The idea that that they're to give a fuller picture, I guess, as it is, of what of what of who these people are, and and, and the kinds of conflicts and the kinds of cooperation, for that matter. That that we, that we see. Well, something we really worked hard on at the Daily Times was to make sure that the newspaper reflected the community that it serves, um, and it's not always easy to do, especially as the business changes and as communities change and as readership, their ideals sort of change. Um, not everyone wants to hear the positive news. A lot of times they they're they're more attracted. They all look at the car crash. You know, they don't look at the flowers growing along the road, right. but they'll all turn their head to the car crash. So there's that sort of that idea that goes on. But people told me over and over again that they wanted, that they felt like the newspaper um, was sort of an alien in their hands. It didn't really match what they knew of the community. It didn't reflect the, the, the stuff that they worked on that mattered. Um, and I don't pretend to compete at all with the Daily Times. They have their role. It's a, it's a great newspaper. They do a really good job. Um, their website is amazing. You know, I'm, yeah. I, you know, and so they're doing their thing, and I'm going to do mine. Um, and it's going to be true community news. It's going to be the, the fire department promotions and the Boy Scout um, um, inductions and the hospice fundraisers. Um, I'm looking forward this week. We're going to have uh, a photo page of uh, the party that's taking place at the Civic Center for the big wrestling tournament, the professional mm -hmm. wrestlers here in town. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the kind of hokey thing that the Daily might or might not cover. I, I don't care. But it's we're going to have pictures of people from our community interacting with wrestlers in a social situation and it could be a lot of fun it could be a disaster but it could be a lot of fun so that's what we want to get to but i was going to ask you how big of a role do you see photographs playing i mean you, you talk about it i think in the in your editorial you talked about the idea that, it, that newspapers are print but they're also pictures how do you see the the role of, of photographs being played out in, in your publication? Yeah, it's really important. And with the technology now, it's so different. Yeah. I mean, when I started um, 
in order to get a job as a reporter, you basically had to have a camera and be able to work in a dark room. You had to be able to, <laughs> yes. you know, to take care of your own photos. Now everyone can take excellent photos on their phone. So, and the public can contribute photos. Uh, we've run some some very nice um, uh, landscape photos that have been submitted from from people you know in the community. And certainly any kind of a a, a fundraiser or an event. Um, people can take photos of themselves and you just like they do on Facebook and we'll put that in the paper and people love to look at that people one of the universal things in newspapers and I don't know if it's a secret or not people love to read their name in the paper and it's up to us to get it spelled correctly which right. doesn't always happen and they love to see their photos in the paper and they love to see pictures of their friends um, and yeah it's like a like a scrapbook somehow a community scrapbook um, so photos are really important names and faces and just so the paper looks like the community that we serve um, I think one of the problems with Wicomico is that maybe in the in the newspaper coverage around, you'll see lots of coverage from Ocean City. Um, you'll see lots of coverage from the Western Shore, even like down in Virginia and Somerset County, Delaware, certainly a lot on oh, television. Yes. Delaware is a big component to their coverage on television. But you don't always see the Salisbury coverage that you'd like. Salisbury seems to get left out sometimes. Well, why do you think that is? Um, I, th- I think journalistically... Um, I I think journalistically that that Salisbury isn't always that interesting. I mean, it's sort of the base, and you're you're here all the time, so you kind of get used to it. So you're not as intrigued by what goes on, maybe. Um, you know, I, I know our problem. One of our problems with the Daily Times is that we covered Room 301 at the government office building to death, but we right. never got out in the neighborhoods and wrote the real good neighborhood stories like I thought that we needed to do, which is something that I want to do in this publication. Um, I think like you just don't notice things around your house like you do at someone else's house the same way. <laughs> um, I had a reporter that I hired one time say, why are all the high schools in this county on the same street? And I went, they are. <laughs> There's three high schools within two miles of each other all on the same street. Now, I know how that happened, but it never occurred to me that that was unusual. You know, So you sort of need that outside thing, the outside influence looking at things. Um, so I think those of us who live here might not cover the Salisbury with the same sort of exotic flair that we would... Um, the other communities. And you see this with the metros, uh, where they parachute in, they write the big tell-all story from the community, and then they leave. <laughs> right, know? exactly. And they're not around for the for the ramifications. You know, all the reporters at the Sun of the Post want to write the uh, the definitive, um, you know, Purdue Farms is a terrible entity, you know, kind of thing to sort of make their career, even though we know it's not true, that what Purdue contributes to the community far outweighs anything that could be negative, and the stuff that comes up as negative it's always dealt with. I mean, I'm always impressed by that. So, yeah, I just I just think that that Salisbury just needs better community coverage. So what role do you see the the internet playing and and your web presence for that matter um, in in this publication? Yeah, I don't know that I have the web solution exactly yeah. what I want. I mean, there's such a, a stretch uh, or an emphasis on mobile right now. Oh yeah. Um, you know, we're four issues in, so I'm not quite quite. You know, I'm not doing the mobile platform like I would like. I'm trying to develop that. Um, I don't know that many people know about our website yet. We haven't really marketed it like we would like because we're trying to get the paper right get first. Get it first, yeah. Um, which is backwards from all the, the traditional thinking or the new thinking. You know, everything is web first, digital first, mobile first, and then at the end, you you print the paper. Um, I'm kind of going the wrong way on that. and We'll find <laughs> out if that works or not. Um, but our website's nice. I'm getting good uh, feedback on it, but it's not as dynamic as I would like it to be. Um, what you see now in journalism, just how things change so fast. Um, there was a line the other day, someone was talking about blogs, you're going to have a blog. And someone else said, you know, blogs are so 2007. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. You know, people don't read blogs obsessively like they did in 2007. So they're on to the next thing, whatever the next thing is. Um, so I want to make sure I'm positioned for whatever the next thing is, whatever the new platform is, how, whatever people want to do, um, that we can get the content to them in a way that makes sense, uh, that they can enjoy it. Um, you know, these Q and A's, they can take 15, 20 minutes to read. Most people don't have 15, 20 minutes to read something in the morning. Um, so by creating this weekly product with a shelf life, you know, that someone can read it for four or five days, so hopefully, um, and they'll get value out of it. They won't feel like that they're wasting newsprint by the paper stacking up. Um, they're getting a little better experience from a print product versus the digital thing. Um, you know, I tell everyone that, you know, I'm 53 years old, but the happiest I can ever be is if I have a tuna fish sandwich and a newspaper in front of me. I mean, mm. that's just heaven to me. Um, my son, 
who's 17, 18, he won't look at a newspaper unless he has to. Uh, there was a good example. His football team uh, had some coverage in the in the daily last year. Uh, handed him the paper. I said, read this. And he sort of pushed the paper away. He's like, no, 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 no. And he ran upstairs, got his laptop, and read the story on that. That's his preferred platform. So all those readers are out there. Um, I think our demographic in Wicomico County, there's a couple things in our favor in terms of a weekly print product. One of those things is uh, about... 60 percent of the county uh 55 60 percent of the county is age 45 and above so those people are natural newspaper readers um and one of the weird things about this county um in this smsa is that the demographics are so much like america i mean in terms of the the the, um, the age breakdowns um uh, the gender breakdown uh income this really is american miniature in, in salisbury it's an amazing market but where we fall down is connectivity online um, many 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 people vast majority still get their um, online content uh, via a web browser and usually get their work um, we're still very underwired so to speak at people's houses um, and you can see that at the daily where um, you know, we would track the web traffic and people would look at the news at 8 30 in the morning when they arrived at work they look at it at noon when they left for lunch they look at it at 4, right before they would go home, and then traffic would go way down. And then about 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, it would spike back up again because people, you know, like get into bed with their iPads or whatever, and they check things before they go to bed. Um, but still, you know, the last numbers I saw, it was only like 40% of people really are connected you know, with Wi-Fi or the, the fast digital at their homes. So a paper product still makes sense for the demographics in this market. So tell me a little bit about the other people at the paper, I mean, the, the, the publisher and so on, and, and some of the reporting. What, what's, what, what kind of talent have you drawn on out of the community? Well, it's funny. Um, uh, my first hire, in, there's really just two of us doing this right now. It's, right, exactly. It's, it's, it's the smallest shop. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I laughed that I went from having 141 employees uh, five years ago to one. Uh, Welcome to my world, <laughs> right, but that's okay. <laughs> exactly, right now. Um <laughs> But uh, I, Susan Canfor is my reporter, and Susan and I have worked together since 1987. Um, we we were hired within four months of each other at the Daily Times, uh, right out of college. Um, we com- competed with each other, sort of career-wise. Um, I have to say that I, you know, went way past her. Sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm sure I'll hear from her soon. But that's... <laughs> and now we're back together. And uh, Susan's terrific. Susan's one of those people that, uh, to be a good reporter, you have to be someone that people will trust and they'll tell you stuff. You know, and you know, you have to know how to be quiet and listen while they talk. And I'm being a blabbermouth here because you're interviewing me, but there, there's a subtle way of just sort of sitting back and getting the news and getting people to trust you. And Susan is really good at that. She never gets things wrong. Um, you know, when you read a newspaper, the more you know about an issue, the more errors you find in the exactly. newspaper. Um, and she's very good at, at being, you know, keeping it simple. Uh, the old kiss rule, you know, mm-hmm. keep it simple, stupid. Uh, keeping it simple and, and, and writing it correctly um, and really leaving a good trail wherever she goes with the people that she interviews. Um, so I'm enjoying working with him she, or with with her. She's very mm-hmm. good at deadlines, um, and it's a new world for both of us. But so far, it's been a lot of fun. So, what do you see as a, as a as the future of this publication? I mean, do you think that you're going to maintain it simply as a weekly, or if you have some success with it, would you expand it to? I know there. I think it's the Cape Gazette. I think comes out twice a, a yeah. week. That kind of thing. So there's that option too. It's funny you mentioned the Cape Gazette. Uh, Dennis Forney, who runs the Cape Gazette, um, as someone who worked in, at Gannett, I competed with him for a long time. Sure. Uh, growing up around here, I saw. I've read Dennis Forney's products since I was a little kid and admired his method, his model, and what Cape Gazette does up there in Lewis Rehoboth for people who might not know um, is they basically print anything that anybody sends them you know (laughs) with the idea that if it's important to you it's important to us so they will share the news um i just get frustrated reading their editorial pages because they would get like these letter writers on the same topic and they wouldn't let go and i'd be like it's time to move on and dennis one time said no you have to let them keep chewing on that bone you know readers want to do that they they like that they look for the next installment on this thing um so that is a great community newspaper. Um, I would love to emulate that as much as possible. They're in a weird market with you know tourists plus locals. Right. You know, I'm going to be local. Um, uh, a friend of mine, at the Daily Times, actually said, you know, you can be the the from here paper, and we're going to be the come here paper. <laughs> 
you know, now I don't know if that's true, if that's going to be their model, or if it's just a joke. Um, but, you know, I want to appeal to everybody because there are come here's and from here's who still need their community coverage. Uh, in terms of expanding, I have no idea. You know, we'll yeah, see how this we'll goes. goes. Um, and we don't know what the next disruptive innovator is. <laughs> uh, I was just reading a thing, a, a technology of this um, plastic product uh, where a digital newspaper can be displayed on this, wow. this digital plastic project uh, product. So you have the sort of the paper experience uh, while holding something that's still digital. That's right. Who knows what's going to happen? So, how, by the way, I must ask you, so how do you assess um, the changes at the Daily Times? And you were there for a long time, obviously. And when anybody comes in, whatever operation is, it changes and so on. What, what's, what's, your, what's your impression as you go away? I'm really impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they do a really good job. Um, and, I, you know, their mission is different than mine. Certainly, their readership is going to be different. Um, their approach is much more digital than mine. Um, you know, I think you sort of see this idea that videos are a good way to tell stories, and I, I agree with that. Um, but I'm I'm not as video motivated. I'll watch television news, but for some mm-hmm. reason, I don't want to wade through the commercials online and to see a video that might not be very good. I'm not saying their videos aren't good, but sometimes that happens, and you waste a lot of time. And with the connectivity around here, it's it's difficult to get videos before people and have it really be valuable. I think. Um, but that's where they're putting a lot of their eggs. That could be the future, um, for all I know. You see these reporters, uh, they call them mojos, mobile journalists, where they're right. using iPhones to record everything. Um, and I have to admit, they had a story, a very good story, just yesterday, the day before, um, about the guy who was elected uh, down in Princess Anne to the town council, oh, yes, a right. student. Um, and I watched the video report on that. So I learned about that by seeing him. I wanted to see him talk, uh, and I enjoyed the reporter's questions, right. and they were kind of yucking it up a little bit. Um, and it was really an interesting and compelling experience, so I, I have to give them that. But I'm still old school. I'm still believing that what's old is new again. Mm-hmm. Um, I still think the written word is the best way to communicate what goes on. Um, and I think telling stories with photos and headlines and text is still viable, especially in this market. So I want to pursue that. But you know, the daily, you know, they're on their First Amendment thing, which is great. Right. Um, we need that in the community. We need someone to ask the hard questions. They certainly have the resource to, to do that. Um, so my hope is that they do their thing, and I'm going to do mine. And between the two of us, we're going to make the community better. One of the things, by the way, you talk about the print as opposed to the video. One of, one of the things that, I, that I've always found, the contrast between I see something as print as opposed to, say, certainly in radio, to hear somebody, is that print tends, print tends and sometimes, I think, tends to drain the personality out of out 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 of, of what is being quoted, and if you hear it, in right? Particularly extent, it, it's a much different experience. I mean, do you agree with that? I mean, that's, I would. You know, I would. I think all those different mediums are really, yeah, really interesting. Um, you know, I grew up uh, when there was sort of a revival in um, uh, radio theater. Uh, CBS mm. used to have a thing there in the mid seventies, uh, right? Where E.G. Marshall used to host it at ten o'clock at night, and to hear stories told. You know, via words, uh, and certainly what NPR does every day between you know between all things considered and Morning Edition, and Ira Glass, and all, you know, the millions of things that I listen to, that radio experience is totally unique, and it's a completely different way to tell stories. Usually, you're in your car, that's true, you know, or you're doing a podcast, you know, while you're working out or um, um, falling asleep at night, that kind of thing. Um, so the the platform that you're on when you're listening to that is is a little bit different, but still um, stories can definitely be told uh, verbally. And some of the best journalism I've ever heard has been stuff that I hear you know on the radio. The NPR series they did on the border. Um, oh yeah, that's one of those topics that I have very little patience for uh, because I just don't get the arguments sometimes about <laughs> about immigration. And I don't understand all the the mm-hmm. tension about it hearing that series changed how I thought about everything with that. So that's that's a power of radio. I don't think I could have read a piece in the Washington Post that would have had the same experience or in a local newspaper, but certainly that radio experience made a big difference. So uh, looking at, at, Sol- at Salisbury, what uh, what do you see as the, as the future? What what kind of development? Obviously, you've uh, emphasized a little bit about the downtown area, which is, looks as if it's going to get a lot of attention. How do you see the future as opposed to what you've seen? In I'm, I'm banking uh, and staking my career and my business, <laughs> and business I'm a part of on the idea that Salisbury is about to hit a renaissance, that the pieces are in place, that the economy is coming back, that there's an interest, that, that there are there's leadership here now, 
through the Chamber of Commerce and through the city government and through the service clubs. Salisbury has an amazing amount of service clubs. It has three rotaries. Um, yeah. The Salvation Army here is incredible. The, uh, the, um, um, just everywhere you look, there's some sort of a nonprofit. Coastal Hospice, you know, yeah. is, it's just, is in, it's incredible. It's just, it just fascinates me. The Community Foundation, um, uh, United Way, our United Way uh, is incredible. So there are all these people who aren't necessarily elected by anyone, but they're making a difference in the community, and they, they work hard every day. Chamber of Commerce, I see a complete difference in Chamber of Commerce. Just they're motivated. The leadership is young. Uh, Bradley Gillis was just the president. He's To me, he's a kid, you know? <laughs> and he has ideas yeah. that I would never have and, and notions that I would never have. Uh, he and his partner have taken over this uh, the firehouse downtown. That's right. I would never have the courage to try to redevelop that thing, <laughs> but they have the energy and the vision to do that, you know. And they're either going to succeed or they're going to fail. But I think Salisbury's on a re- on a, the, on a, about to have a renaissance. Um, I think downtown's about to pop. We've heard forever that downtown's back, downtown's back, and it's never right. back. Never back. You think this time is it? <laughs> we have a column. Um, my friend Mike Dunn wrote a good column this week. He says this time is for real. So so we'll see. Well, we're speaking with uh, Greg Bassett. He is uh, with the Salisbury Independent, a new publication, just uh, within the last month, I guess it is. And uh, we're talking a little bit about the role that he sees. And, uh, of course, everybody is m- familiar with you because you were certainly with the Daily Times for, for a very, very long time. Both good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's, it's most It's not bad. all milk and honey. Uh, anyway, I appreciate you stopping by and talking with us. Thank you, Don. This has been fun. Thank you. This has been Delmarva Today, a production of Delmarva Public Radio. Chris Rank produces and is our audio engineer. Don Rush is your host. For podcasts, visit our website, delmarvapublicradio.net, or subscribe to the Delmarva Today podcast in iTunes. Delmarva Today can now be seen on Pack 14 To view the schedule, visit the Daily Times or visit pack14.org. Mm-hmm.